This conference will now be recorded. So that's evidence I didn't forget to put the recording on. Um, again, welcome to the Pay It Forward event number three, Igniting Your Creativity. We are going to talk about all those different stimulus that can ignite that creativity in, inside of us. Right now, sometimes during the winter, I get a little bluesy and the, the ideas don't come as quickly as I'd like them to. And especially during COVID, um, it's keeping us inside. And so we have access to less stimulation. So for this session, I'm going to help you think of new ideas, new ways to inspire that spark, um, explore the fuel that, that sets off the fire and encourage that, that curiosity for the fireworks. So um, I wanna find new inspirational sources. Um, let's stimulate new ideas and ignite free thought because we're always told, we're often told, not always told, often told that you shouldn't do it that way. You can't do it that way. And I'm sort of um, one of those people that say, please don't tell me I can't do that because I think I can. So that's that stubborn part of me. Um, people have been asking me, uh, why am I doing, why am, are Chris and I doing these pay it forward events? And I'll briefly tell you that three years ago, my husband and son were in a horrible uh, explosion. They are both burn survivors, but they went through a whole lot to get to where they are today. And a lot of really cool stuff has actually come of it. And um, so we wanna share with other people. We want to give back to some of the people that really supported us when it was really hard from day to day, figuring out um, where your head was. And this community has been tremendous. And so we feel a great need to, to be a part of, you know, a, a pay it back movement. So anyway, that was that. So the other thing I'm sort of excited about, and I should say sort of, I get very excited for freebies when I'm receiving them. So I'm hoping some of you will get excited if you get to get one of the giveaways that I'm that Chris and I are, are doing today. Now you'll notice that first picture is one of Chris's opals. He's been cutting opals specially for these events and giving them away for, for to see someone make something beautiful. So if you're one of the winners, it would be really, really great if you showed us what you make from his opals. So that's one of the giveaways. I also have a tool and some clay to give away, and I'm pretty excited about doing that. So I'm gonna stop every so often, A, so you don't fall asleep on me, and B, so you can get something real fun to play with later on to ignite more of that inspiration. So one of the things I often say to my students is we are inspired by all the stimulus around us. If you take away that stimulus, like we're doing during COVID, a lot of the stimulus is being taken away. Um, it makes it harder to be creative. So what I'm going to talk about today is how to go within yourself to think of stimulation that you've already been exposed to. And some of the main areas that I see that, that we'll go through today is our senses. Um, when we hear things, um, it might bring back memories of a different time or different place. When we touch things, um, how does that feel and how, does, how do we react to that in a visual way? Um, when we see things, you know, we have stimulation all around us um, when it comes to architecture and nature and things like that. How can we use that to stimulate our creativity? So we're gonna answer a lot of these questions. Another one is your smell and your taste. Um, how can you use that to create from? 
So we're going to think outside the box a little bit here. And we're going to, hopefully, you brought something to eat and a spice to smell and um, pen, pencil and paper. So if you did, could you write in the comments, I did it, I did it, I, I brought my stuff. If not, um, you're more than welcome to excuse yourself and get something uh, real quick. But anyway, I'm going to keep going. Um, another stimulation is our emotions. Boy, they are a huge part of who we are, but yet they could be the hardest to tap into because we're trying to take something that's um, hard to grasp and make it tangible, make it a visual you know, in our jewelry and things like that. So that that's a hard one. Not only that is we're getting very personal. We're getting down to the core of who we are and there's a lot of exposure there. So that that that's a hard one to tap into, but we're gonna we're gonna come up with ways to do that. Um life experiences are are a wonderful place to to get things. Uh places that you've been sorrow, uh, elation, all the wonderful things that have happened in our lives, the places that we go. There's so many memories um, and popular themes. It, it, when, it, it was funny, I was talking about this yesterday in a class, um, how culture, what's going on in the environment can affect what we're doing. And COVID has really affected a lot of what we're doing. And so I'm seeing, you know, big germ earrings of the COVID virus and toilet paper. Uh, I saw a toilet paper beaded necklace and, and things like that. So we are responding to what's going on around us. And, and in some ways, it can be a really wonderful thing. And in other ways, it's an outlet for us to express ourselves. So I want to start off with hearing, OK? So I'm going to play something for you, and I'm wondering if you'll recognize what it is. If I'm not mistaken, um, this is a music score from Danny Elfman, and it, it can anybody guess what movie that this score was to? See, the scores of movies can really stimulate your thoughts about what they want you to feel during that time. Um, wonder. Um, right before a fight scene where those those cymbals crash and those drums really pound. So movie scores often have no, no words to them. And so it lets your imagination really go free. So how, how do we interpret some of the commonplace things or the music that we hear and things like that? So one of the things I'm getting a note. Okay, I need to be closer to my audio, so I'm going to make that louder. The music. Anyway, um, so Chris just dropped me a note that said my audio is not great, so I'm coming a little closer, making it a little louder, so I hope you can hear me a little bit better. Um, so this, the picture that you're seeing here is a pen and ink drawing made from a movie score. And how, I'm, how I was using it was I would turn on the music and I think of my line and design section of my Designing with Intention course. And I'm thinking about how could I use the lines it, to express the sounds that I'm hearing. 
So when I hear something um, getting more dramatic, the line gets thicker. When I'm hearing rhythm, I start to create multiple lines and, and things like that. So this was my interpretation of that music. Now your interpretation might be very, very different and that's a good thing. We don't all wanna be coming out with the same things. So different kinds of music will elicit different responses. So I think about the different music genres that there are, um, the classical music, the rock music. I mean, some, some of the rock music takes me back to high school when we were sitting in somebody's basement just listening to rock music, that kind of thing. So I have an image right there with some of the, that kind of music. And um, when you listen to some of the scores that are to the movies, they really can elicit that drama that they really want to build and it's building and building. And how would you interpret that in a drawing? That's the question or the romance in some of the scenes that they want you to just fall in love with the couple on the screen as much as and fall in love with the music. Then there's other sounds that are a little bit more annoying, like the sound of a dripping faucet, or nails on a chalkboard. What are your reactions to that? And that's what we're trying to tap into. What are the reactions? And then how do you, how do you use it more visually? in in your work um one game that chris and i play often is we'll go out on the porch and um, we live in the country so we'll close our eyes and we'll listen to the nature and try to figure out what it is that we're listening to or how many birds that we hear or how many different sounds of the birds we hear or the water trickling in our pond um, or the sound of the leaves going through the trees. Each one of those senses, um, while we try to imagine it, we're trying to visualize it with, with our eyes closed. And re it really helps us tune into the sounds. And it can be pretty neat to just listen to everything that's around you that we sometimes take for granted. So from the drawing, um, I made a photopolymer plate. And this is the texture that you saw in the drawing in the photopolymer plate. And I was trying to pay attention to how can I interpret that music, those lines into a piece of jewelry and how to capture the tempo and how it made me feel and the rhythms that, that were being played and the emotion inside of me. How do I bring that out in a piece of jewelry? So this is the piece of jewelry that came from that. And I call this jewelry that rocks because the center piece here is an upcycled CD. And the, ups, the, the CDs I love the most, believe it or not, are gaming CDs because they're very colorful. And what I do is there, there's a spiral saw that cuts plastic really nicely. And so I cut the plastic and then I sandwich it between the metal that I created from the photopolymer plate. And I love this little pop of red because it's sort of unexpected. But even the patterns on the CD helped tell the story of, of what I was trying to say. Now, somebody else that listens to the, which is really interesting, interesting is that other people in the class that listen to the same music come up with something completely different. That's because each of us has our own reference points and life experiences that enter into the picture. And, you know, that's the cool thing about being an artist, I think, is being able to express yourself differently than, than somebody else. So I wanna get into now touching. Um, the, this, I made a texture plate from the wormholes that are in the tree branch there because I thought they were very cool. And so, you know, a lot of us that are in the audience are metal clay artists or other jewelers. 
and texture is huge and we're great at noticing it. And that is one advantage, I think, of being an artist is noticing all the little details. And um, it's very important that we pay attention to the whys. Um, in, in a lot of my classes, somebody will say, well, that brings up an emotion. I want to know what emotion that is. That I, I love texture. What kind of texture do you love? Um, I, I'm, I always was a why person. How do things work? And um, that the more that you know about your own reactions to things, the more you can bring to the table when you're making your jewelry. So um, you know, it's you know, I think it's important to pay attention to how soft an item is and flexible and smooth and what entices you about it. Um, it's the why are you attracted? Why do you like it? Why don't you like it? Those are the questions that take you deeper and deeper into your creative being and help you express something a little bit more meaningful for yourself. Um, when we look at rough items and the textures, what is it that, that makes you curious and want to touch it? Why do textures draw our eyes? And what kind of textures are really drawing your eyes? So another game that Chris and I play, um, when we go to a lot of arboretums because I, I just we both love nature, but I, I can go there and take thousands of pictures. It's almost like studies of the plants and things like that. But the game that we play is we'll walk around and one of us will um, feel a leaf. And a lot of times the leaf doesn't feel like it looks like it would, like it might look fuzzy, but it feels prickly. So it's sort of a fun game to say, what do you think this feels like? And then the next person touches it and, and really can describe it in such different ways than maybe even the first person, or it, it's so contrary to what it looks like it might be. But, um, you know, that's another sense that we can totally tap into. So from that texture, and some of these pieces of jewelry are pretty old at this point, <laughs> but this was a floating mother of pearl in here. And this was that, that texture from, from the wormholes. And I wanted to have some openings in there. And this is a little hollow form, but just that experience of seeing that inspired this piece. And so it's always very interesting to see where your inspirations are going to come. Uh-oh, another drawing. Well, I shouldn't say, uh-oh, this is exciting. Okay, so actually this is the first drawing. The, the, the first slide was what we're going to draw. Now we're going to talk about who's gonna win this. So um, how did we do this last time, Chris, in picking a person? Um, I think Chris randomly ro rolls some dice and the position in where your names are, that determines who wins it. So Chris, okay. you want to tell us who the winners of the- Sure, so the winner for the clay for the first giveaway is Deborah Reardon. Hey, Deborah, way to go. And I know she works with base metal, so this is cool. Awesome. So this is 20 grams of Prometheus greenish yellow bronze clay. And I haven't used that myself, but I'd love to see what you make with it, Deborah. Okay. Let's go on with more stimulation and what we can use to ignite some ideas. So of course there's touching, and by touching we can connect with the world in a more physical way. So let's explore some less obvious explorations of doing that. Oh, sorry, I think I'm in the wrong place. Now I've confused myself. So 
so touching. We're looking again at that um, wormhole markings of in the branch. But they have it now we're looking at it in a different way this time. We're looking at the tactile feel of it and the textures that it's going to make. So there are things that we can really explore as far as the way things feel. So the coarseness of concrete, the softness of dryer lint. I mean, does anybody even think about looking at their dryer lint? It's actually pretty soft stuff. Um, the skin of a young person, and I don't know why I'm touching my own skin because I don't qualify for that anymore, but uh, and an older person where you can feel the creases and the crevices and their wisdom. Um, the texture of tapestry versus the really softness of silk, even the way it lays and, and flows is different from one to the next. So the next one is seeing. We are attracted and exposed to visual stimulation constantly, constantly. Um, what if we took an extra 10 seconds when we're looking at things and really deeply concentrate on the details? A lot of times we say we like this or we like that, but we don't necessarily go, well, why is that? Or what is it that's attracting me to it? Or what's this make me think of? Um, so th this, these were in my favorite place, um, the Oldy Forest. And I was, we were scavenger hunting for different dry pods before I have a pod cl class day that I teach elegant meadow pods. And the natural forms can really be um, a stimulation. And so I'm looking at this and I'm trying to figure out, well, why is this so interesting to me? This is really the the end of life for a plant, but it's these cool little tendrils and the representation of life that it had, like at the end of what there was, yeah. <laughs> Problem I've got is sorry. I'm trying to mute everybody when they enter. Um, so the natural forms, I'm asking myself, why am I so attracted to the pods? And I realized that it is the, 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 the It is the dropping of the pods and it starts uh, the seeds of the pods and it starts that whole cycle again in architecture, you know, the sculptural forms and things like that in our environment. It is important for us to pay attention to um, the history, the, the relationships to these items, like the architecture in Mexico is so different than the architecture in downtown Philadelphia. Um, it talks a lot about the people that settled there and the art that they that they brought with them. So art through the ages makes a difference because um, they had different technology that they were bringing to the table and different um, influences. You know, in Mexico, they had a lot of Spanish influences come to that area. In some areas, a lot of Victorian influences came to that area. So all of these things play a role in, you know, what we're seeing. So for this instance, um, I'm suggesting when you go to an arboretum, a forest, something like that, really take a magnifying glass, study the lines and the repetition of, of nature. Um, when you're looking at sculpture, look at the shape and the size, but look at the people who made it. What is what are their background? What did they bring to the mosaic tiling that you might see, or the carved um, marble sculpture that you're seeing? All of these things are part of who they are, 
and in their art. And so that's what I'm suggesting we bring to our art is things that are part of who we are. So I also like to look for the symbolism. In different cultures, there are symbols that have meaning to it. There are, you know, I did um, a retreat in Hawaii and we studied the petroglyphs, which were, they're very similar to hieroglyphs where they're, they're, they're rock drawings, but it was about their life and about what they do and what they think is important. So these symbols meant something. They meant, uh, again, what's important to them? What, what, what has a lot of meaning? So when you study art in that kind of way, it sort of brings a whole new level of meaning to it. And then I like to look at the different um, periods in history. And each one, I was telling this to my students yesterday, each generation is often rebelling against the generation before. Um, somehow we're gonna do it better, we're gonna do it bigger, we're gonna do it faster, whatever it is, we don't wanna do it like they did it. And therefore, it, it, it's a resurgence of new ideas, new ways of doing things, an interest in developing technology or, or, uh, or new ways, new techniques to bring things out. It's, it's our interest in bringing our identity to it. So this is the finished piece of Nature's Renewal, totally um, from the walks that we've taken, the pods that I've seen on the ground, the leaves that are around me, the seeds and things like that. So here's our second giveaway. Oh, these are popping up fast, aren't they? Now, I love this doohickey. Um, this is a proportional wheel, all packaged up and brand new. And what it does is it helps you size things up and down if you need to enlarge it or reduce it. And it has a handy dandy wheel where you line up um, and, and easy instructions right on it on figuring out. You don't have to do any math, which makes me really happy. So Chris, can you roll your handy dandy dice and let us know who's going to win that? Yes, the winner for this is Ava Barbour. Oh, Ava, way to go, Ava. That's awesome. Okay, so everybody that wins something, if you could send me an email with your address so that we can send it, that would be great. So the next sense is smell. Now I remember um, watching a MASH show and Hawkeye, one of the characters, smelled something that was musty. And it brought up this emotional response for him because of something that happened in the swamp or whatever. But it was such a great recall of memory. And I think about different things that bring those kind of reactions to me. And one of them is, I inherited this perfume bottle from my grandmother. It sat on her dresser. And um, it just makes me think of her. And for the longest time, I could open up the little stopper and take a quick sniff and, and shut it and it would smell like my grandmother. And I knew that one day that that smell would be gone because I would have opened it up one time too many, which of course actually did happen. But just the flood of memories of going over to her house, she always had something cooking on the stove and um, she'd always give us this these handmade pot holders. You knew she loved you if you got one of her potholders. So anyway, the smell was so strong for me and I wanted to make a piece from this. Um, but there's other smells that can be strong for everyone. Um, just little teeny things like essential oils. Some of them have some powerful um, metaphysical properties and um, healing properties. Um, rotten food, boy, that just really sticks in your nose and makes you think of certain things. 
you know, like when you open the refrigerator and something sat in there a little bit too long and you have to actually guess what it once was. Um, you know, even medicines can take you back to a place like when, you know, when my father was in the hospital, I, that, that smell that really sticks in my nose what that was like every time we visited, you know, it really conjures some memories. So is there anything in that that we can use So what I did for this example is I took the deco design from the middle of that bottle and I combined it with one of my techniques called negative space caning. So in this example, um, what I've got is, I don't know if you've ever seen polymer clay caning where they take uh, different colors and they roll it up and then they could cut canes and they, you would have the exact same pattern in each slice. Well, in my sample, I'm using metal clay and a combustible material. So the whole idea was I wanted multiple patterns that were repeatable, but where the combustible material was, it would fire away in the kiln and I would have a space there. So it would be metal and then, then intricate spaces. So in this example, um, what I ended up with was this. So the center of this is the center of that bottle. And then um, these were the canes. So everywhere there was a space, I put a combustible. In this case, it was um, wood clay. And if you want to know more about this, this is my very last seminar about the what if factor it's like when you say okay what if i'm going to try this and so you know for me it was ended up being like i invented this technique which was sort of cool but anyway um it enables me to have what do work for one cane and then slice it and then have a repeat here repeat here repeat here so that was that was sort of interesting but this all came from the smell of that bottle, which is sort of cool. So taste. So this, the, the smell and the taste is something that I want to experiment with you after um, I'm done the presentation. And we're going to taste things and smell things and see how that can stimulate some creative ideas for, for jewelry. And I will show you some examples of things other people have done in in some of these open seminar that I that I've conducted. But anyway, um, how can you use taste to stimulate art ideas? Um, in 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 so many instances, we use celebration, and food is so much a part of it. We go to a wedding and it's this lavish layout of food. We go to a funeral and there's also a lavish layout of food, but they feel so different. The kinds of foods might be different. Um, they might be culturally related, but food is so much a part of our lives for celebrating or um, gathering around a table. Um, so many times Chris and I have done retreats and it's about the food and the art. We make art and then we sit around the table and Chris cooks for us. And the whole day we're smelling the food and we're wondering what it is. And, um, and then we sit there and we talk and we connect. And it just is a real important part of eating. So for this, this was the stipulation for a piece of jewelry that I did. And uh, these are squash flowers that Chris grew in the garden. He knows I like I like the pods. He likes to cook them. So what you do is you batter dip squash flowers when they're open, and you can actually eat them. Well, what happened is Chris collected all these pods and he put them in the refrigerator. Now see this little bug sitting up on the corner there. That bug actually made it into our uh, into a flower, got closed up and lived in our refrigerator overnight until the next day when it came out of the refrigerator, the flower opened and the bug flew out. So I call this blossoms for dinner because the little bug had the idea of having it for dinner, but so did we. 
so anyway um you know like the tartness of food the textures of food they can all be part of the stimulation like these stalks they have like these teeny little prickles when you feel them it's totally different than the smooth supple um pod leaves you know i think about the sensations of when you're eating a nut versus when you're eating chocolate one just melts in your mouth the other one it has a texture, it has a feel, it has a grittiness maybe to it. Um, so what I like to do is I like to try different foods and the you learn about the people of 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 the different lands that that these foods came from. Um, I think about comfort food, how just how it it not only how it makes you feel up here, but how it makes you feel in your belly. How it how how it's warming. Why is that comfortable for us? So it's all the whys that I like to know. So the next step with the pods is um, this is my Repose effects and metal clay class, and what we do is we take the photographs and we simplify them. We make a good composition, but then we wet work polymer clay and we put metal clay into it after it's been baked. So anyway, I'm trying to capture the essence of what I see. And because I'm an artist, I get to eliminate all this other background stuff that doesn't have a good composition to it. I get to decide what goes into my jewelry and what doesn't go into my jewelry. So, um, you know, I think about all the facial expressions that food makes, like, uh, all of the sensations. What's the texture? What is my face doing? How is my body feeling? Where? What is it doing to me when I eat? Is it just fulfilling a need of, of nutrition or is there some other delay and joy of, of eating? So this is the final piece for the blossoms for dinner. And um, and that was a lot of fun to find my own, you know, to know that he grew those pods because I like them, that he cooked something that was delicious. So this this piece has meaning to me. And that's what I think that we're all trying to do is bring meaning and purpose to what we're trying to say. Not everything has to be pretty per se, but it should be something from your heart or your gut or a deeper place within yourself. That's when it's, I think, the most satisfying anyway. So emotions, I think that one is a really hard one to tap into. Um, I've got a couple classes that, that tap into the emotion. I, um, in the Designing with Intention course, I do a line and design uh, practice, and we really pay attention to how lines are either energetic or not so energetic. So like a straight line across would be like that flat lining, not very energetic. But, you know, the high waves and things like that, that's more energetic. So we try to take all of those lines and express ourselves in different emotions. And it is hard. It is hard to take something that's hard to grasp onto and make a visual out of it. But it can be so satisfying when you're actually able to express yourself in that kind of way, because that's one of the harder ones to capture in, in a piece of jewelry. So for this example, um, I'm going to be showing you uh, the kinetic movement piece that came from this, but this is a piece of memorabilia that came from my grandfather's house. And for some odd reason, I had to have this little chair. The chair is about, I don't know, three inches tall, five inches tall, something like that. Well, when I was about five, I thought I could sit in it and, and rock in it. Well, of course I smashed it into like a pancake and I got in trouble, um, but this had meaning to me, you know, like I had such a wonderful relationship with my grandfather. He was always so giggly and everything like that. But when I got in trouble, it was it was serious because I think he picked this up from Germany or something like that from one of his trips. So um, 
so there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in in this piece of memorabilia. So the one thing I want you to pay attention to is this element here, right on the back of the chair. And I'm going to show you how I use that element in the upcoming piece of jewelry. But I'm using my emotions to make to make art, to really um, tap into something that's important to me. So we can tap into our anger. We can tap into our fear, love, hate. There's so many different topics of emotion, um, our empathy. You know, after 9-11, um, I came up with a piece called When Peace Talks, and it had symbols of peace and love. My emotion was that I just wish there was peace and calm in the world. You know, that was my way of expressing that. So anyway, we're looking at this element here, right? So in this lesson, what I do is I take that element and I tessellate it around to make these spinners. And so this is part of the element and the other part goes on the other piece. But anyway, um, so the question is, what kind of emotions can the things in your home help bring out in you, the things that people gave you? Um, how do they feel in your body? That feeling in your body is a useful tool for creating. Can you convert that feeling into a texture? Can you convert it into a motion of a, or a line? How do you how how do you represent that tightness in your chest, or that tension in your back, or that pain in my neck that I've been feeling for a while now? Um, these are expressions of my body telling me something, and so how can I use that in creating and making jewelry? So this is the final piece for for this. This was the first um, kinetic spinning necklace that I need. Um, I've done a lot more and. Um, I, I would like to think that they get better over time. But basically, this top part has a pendulum coming down. So it swings back and forth, but also these spinners turn. And as they turn, you get to see that pattern. So if you paid attention to that pattern on the chair, see that? And I come back to this. And it's represented in two separate spinners. Okay, so that was sort of fun to figure out. That That's um, a mind bender when you're first working on these to make those negative spaces look interesting and whatnot. But, um, and then this was like the back, part of the back of the chair. So uh, I think of my grandfather every time I wear that. So then there's life experiences. Oh my gosh, there's so many themes in, in love, hate, um, and we bring the all personal meaning to it. Everybody's, you know, um, I've heard some people say there's nothing new. Well, some of the themes aren't new. I mean, love has been done over and over and over again. Flowers have been done over and over and over again. How are you going to do them differently? That's the question. And what makes a difference is what you're bringing to it, your experiences, what, you know, your trip to the Arboretum, not mine, your, your sadness of death will be different than mine. And that's, that's a, you know, that's is the way it's supposed to be. So life experiences can be huge in, in bringing about um, ideas. We just have to be willing to tap into them. And some of them are a little bit harder to tap into than others because they're personal. So um, in this one, this is, I'm tapping into fantasy. So I don't know if anybody's ever seen Fantasia, but there are these little fairies that uh, skate around and then they start to touch things around them and they come to life. So it's like they're giving life to this to the scenery around them. So life experiences can be anything from any important event, um, personal tragedy, painful encounters, joyful moments, romance, war and peace, love, deception, adventure. That's always a fun one to explore. 
suspense, comedy, fantasy. But even when I talk about life experiences, um, you know, when Chris got into, Chris and my son got into this explosion, um, one of the messages I wanted to send is your your scars are not horrible. They represent the power that they represent survival. So uh, Strange Little Holly decided to to mold it from his his stomach and capture the pattern, and I made him some jewelry from that. And from that experience, we went to a camp and we taught kids how to do it, and it was transformative. I mean, everybody there pretty much despises their scars, but then when they rep when they could see them as something that was their strength. There's the thing that got them through all of this was being able to, you know, have these scars and and they they tell a tale of survival, of bravery, of of all of that. And so it totally changed the paradigm of what a scar was. And that was just an amazing, amazing experience for everybody and and truly for for me and Chris. So anyway, from the Fantasia, I start putting together my ideas. How am I going to capture that fantasy of Fantasia? Um, what colors, you know, what themes am I going to use? Um, how does that, that experience make my face look? You know, like when I'm watching something romantic, I'm probably like these googly eyes watching, you know, the romance and, and picturing myself and in a horrible uh, situation where there's an ex you know, a battle or something like that, what's your face doing? Like pay attention to those things. They're, they're, those things can be part of your jewelry, the sensations of your body, um, your reactions. So anyway, the piece that came from this was this. It reminded me of the dancers and all of the foliage coming to life and things like that. And so I called it Winter Dance because it reminded me of all the little fairies dancing around. <laughs> uh oh, look what we have here. Chris, you're going to have to unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about this opal and um, give it away to somebody. Okay, this is um, uh, one of my cultured opals. This particular one is backed, so I polished it on the three sides, the front and, and the sides, but of course not the back. Um, been having a lot of fun doing these. It's mostly uh, what I've been working with um, recently for the past year or so, I guess. And I'm always excited uh, when I get uh, some of the opal rough because it's just fun to sit there, look at it, and try to think about what could be uh, what the what the focus could be on within that particular rough as far as what I see in it. And what I usually see are landscapes. I see um, celestial formations. Sometimes I see little birds and animals and things like that. But of course, uh, if if you know about rock cutting, um, you never know what the finished product is gonna end up like. You do have an idea at the beginning, but sometimes through the process, uh, you, you actually reveal even more beauty than you thought was there to begin with. So I am going to give this one away to Bree Drummond. Ooh, Bree. Lucky you, Bree. Everybody give her a little round of applause for that one. You know, Chris actually has an auction going on today on his Facebook page. It started at 10 this morning. It will end at 10 tonight. And he's got some really beautiful ones. He's got some really great blues and greens. And um, some of them are two-sided, which makes possible a two-sided piece of jewelry. And uh, some of them are backed like this, where it only has one, vis you know, the front is visible and the back is a black backing. Um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like you all to, to get out your pencil and paper. And um, I want to talk to you about ideas 
for you to try and execute. So this is my hope. Um, we'll, we'll taste some of the food that we brought. We'll um, smell some of the, the, the herbs or whatever that we bought. And we'll create something on our piece of paper. It doesn't have to be beautiful artwork. It just has to be um, inspired by those things. So what I'll do is I'll talk you about, uh, I'll talk through what you sh could be thinking about. And meanwhile, you could do some drawing. Now, this gets so much more fun if we take our drawings and put them on uh, the metal clay and mixed media form. I sent you guys the link. If you need the link, you can email me a question about it. But um, where we can share, the sharing is the fun part. Now, it doesn't matter if it's perfect. It can be ugly. It, it's, they're all works in progress. They're not finished pieces of jewelry. But the whole idea is to try this out, experiment with some ideas, and see how it can stimulate some of your, uh, some of your thoughts. So what I would like you to do is, if you picked a funky object, so post what objects that you used, what you smelled, and what you what you got from that. It reminded you of uh, a visit to your grandmother. It reminded you of a toy that you had when you were a kid or the smell um, makes you think of a luscious meal that you had in Japan or, or something like that. So I want you to really get into the items itself um, and then show us the drawings that came of it and what parts may have came from what part of your experience. So let me pull up some, some drawings here. Let's see if I, ah, there we go. Now, okay, so when I've done this in person and we were allowed to touch each other and touch the things in the room, which um, I would put out boxes with things inside so that they would lift them up, they would not know what's inside, and they would smell them. And then after they they reacted to it, um, then I would let them see what it was. So some people could guess, and some people never were able to guess. But then it was fun, you know. They they reacted to it without seeing it. But we were trying to tap into our body. Uh, our reaction to it, our body's reaction to it, like how our face may have wrinkled up when we did it. So these were the questions that people looked at. You know, did they trigger images in your mind? Did they trigger um, memories of, of places? Uh, do you have associations? What reaction did your body have? So then um, I got these star anise, and I'm looking at them, and I'm saying to myself, um look at the pods in there and the symmetry now this one is broken but when you get a perfect one which you rarely do um and you got, get this in the um the spice department in your grocery store and uh, i've seen people really use these but the taste of them okay when i taste it it tastes like licorice and that takes me right to this uh, store. When I was a kid, we used to always, I mean, when I was a kid, you could just go somewhere. Your parents didn't know where the heck you were. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia. We went to the store and they had like candy galore. And they had this black licorice that came in strands. And I used to love to pull it apart. It was the sensation of pulling it up, nodding it, all kinds of things. But the taste is very, very distinctive. Um, if black had a taste, I think this is what it would taste like. But when I first tasted the anise, it gave a different sensation. Like, well, first of all, this has been in that box for a long time, so it wasn't as fresh, but it made my face react, you know, like, hmm, that's different. So I'd like to, you know, how am I reacting to that? And, but the flooded memory, it was such a good one. You know what I mean? And the nodding of the licorice. So how would I use that? Could I use um, wire or snakes of metal clay and, and nod it up in, in artistic ways? Or maybe not in so artistic ways. Maybe it would look chewed up after I 
had eaten it. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of interpretations on, on how that could go. But anyway, okay. So this was one of the items that I that was in a bag that nobody was allowed to see, but they had to stick their hand in and touch it, which was really cool because they didn't know what they were feeling. And I was trying to pick something that had tactile feelings, but was also smooth and, and things like that. So from just the object, not seeing it, they got to see it afterwards, one of the students came up with this. So I'm not quite sure if that could be the center point to a pendant or an earring, but you can sort of see where some of the inspiration came from, like the knobbies, which ended up here, and the smooth part that ended up here. But then he added this little, she or he added this little dangle and they gave it like some little horns and things like that. So they elaborated on what they saw and felt. Well, actually what they felt because they didn't see it till afterwards. I let everybody see what it was. Okay, so here's another one that was done in one of these classes. And I wanted them to react to the picture. Now, I think this was a picture I took of a stairwell or skylights actually, a st stairwell, skylights and, and there was a stairwell next to it. So this was the stimulation, like how could you make a piece of jewelry from this visual? So this is the piece of jewelry that was designed from that. Now, mind you, these were like half hour sessions. I mean, this part of the session was like a half an hour. It wasn't like they had a whole lot of time. They were just fooling around. So let's see where they pulled this from. You know, like this strip became this. And uh, these little dots became that. So he didn't use all of them. He curated them. And then these spaces became that. And even these. So that was that one. So my question to you is, how are you going to use the spices that you have and the sp smells that you have to do yours? How are you going to make that work? So um, what I want you to do is pull out your spice and I want you to smell it. I want you to experience it in every which way that you can. Now, you don't have the blind experience that they had, but you get to touch it and feel its texture. So some of the spices are teeny little grains, okay? Some of them are little seeds. Some of them are little um, leaves. So I'd like you to experience it in every which way. Is there a texture that you could draw from it? And then when you taste it, like all by itself, without being in another food, what is that sensation on your tongue? What are you getting from, from that? Does it make you think of a meal that you've had? Does it stand alone and just make you think of being out in the forest because it smells earthy? So I'd be interested in hearing some people in the chat, their reaction to the spices that they have. Now, then the next question is, okay, so you have the spice, you're getting all the sensations. And so what I would do is I would take them and write a list of words, okay? This reminds me of grandmom's comfort food. Um, the texture is granular, but not so, it, it not, not like sand or salt, but finer, and th it makes the taste a little more subtle. Um, do you feel anything in your body, a reaction? If you were going to put a texture to it, if you were going to recreate it, what would that texture look like? Could you actually use it for the texture that you want to use? Okay, so all of these questions, you're not just going, oh, I like the smell. You are saying, I like the smell because, and then the list comes flying out. 
Now it's the same thing with the food that you brought. What does it look like? When you chew it, what is the sensation that you're getting in your mouth? Does it melt or do you really have to work hard? And do you picture your teeth being full of whatever this is? <laughs> like caraway seeds, they would, you know, they'd be in each and every tooth that I have. Um, does that bring out something funny for you, thinking about that being in every tooth that you have? Um, so I would like you to write down all of the sensations, the textures, the feels, of, uh, how it reacts in your body. Maybe there is no reaction. Maybe there's a really adverse reaction. Like, oh, I remember when I was a kid, my mother put mayonnaise in her hair because she said, somebody told her it was very good and, you know, it, it makes your hair stronger and the protein, yada, yada, yada. Well, meanwhile, it smelled horrible when she stuck her head under a, a hair dryer and I can't eat mayonnaise and I have a very adverse reaction to mayonnaise because of that experience. Um, I've been blaming my mom for years on not being able to put mayonnaise on my my um, bacon lettuce and tomato. But anyway, so one of the one of the experiments was combining more than one experience. So I think I had you get an interesting object, something to eat, and spice. What if you combine those things? So your jewelry would have these interesting textures from the object, maybe, these interesting feels from the spices, um, and these different reactions to the taste. Imagine what a piece of jewelry like that could possibly look like. So this is sort of the end of my part of the presentation. I'd be happy to take some questions and comments about how to use these ideas in, in your jewelry. Have you used music? Um, how are you using your senses? So if you wanna start putting questions in the comments, now again, I would like you to take this challenge to Metal Clay and Mixed Media and put up your your ideas. Maybe they're not so great. Maybe you'll get ideas to improve them, but that could be a lot of fun. So does anybody have any questions for me? And if not, I guess we could end early. And I'd like to know um, who is going to put up something from this experiment? Who is going to challenge themselves to think outside the box and do something that they've never done before? Now, if you put I will in, or I do or I can, in the thing, I am going to X your name in my brain and I'm going to look for your things this afternoon and tomorrow on the Metal Clay and Mixed Media Forum. Yes, you will be able to rewatch this video. You just have to wait for me to process it all. And I, I will. it'll be on my blog and I'll probably announce it on social media. So I think there's one more thing that I wanted to put up here before we left. Um, where did I put it? Uh, Chris and I both wanted to thank everybody. You really do inspire me. Um, and I think you inspire him. You know, every time somebody shows him a piece of jewelry with the opals in it, he just wants to make more, you know, for you. Um, but how you've inspired me is for the last, I don't know, five months, I had a problem with my arm and getting back in the chair and, and doing things again, got a little bit different. And I, I see what you're doing and my students come to my classes and, and then I have to do samples and things like that. And that's so good for me because 
um, it, it gets me back in the chair and that that's inspiration that I need and I draw a lot from my students and I'm hoping to lend a little to them <laughs> if I can. Um, now I'd also like to say the next um, event is a tutorial tutorial sale and giveaways so on my website the page is not up yet because i'm creating it because i don't sell my tutorials so i'm having a tutorial sale for one day only and we're doing giveaways on facebook so there'll be a facebook live every couple hours maybe and we will give something away and the way that you get more um names in the drawing is if you share that if you share a post that mentions the sale then you get a name in the drawing every time you purchase something you get a name in the drawing so um so if you share 10 times that's 10 names in the drawing if you purchase something your name is in the drawing so whatever whatever um again i don't sell my tutorials ever so these are like once in a blue moon kind of thing um, what is the name of Chris Gage's um, Facebook page? It is, well, if you look up Christopher Gage, his name will come up and you can go to his, can go to his website. Um, the longer version is Healing Phoenix Lapidary on Facebook. So I, I am, I'm still looking for more people who are going to join in on this challenge. So thanks for putting your link in there, Chris. Um, you, uh, for the challenge, you will post on Metal Clay and Mixed Media. That is a Facebook forum that I moderate. So let's see, am I missing any questions? So I've got some, I, where do we share? Um, on Metal Clay Mixed Media Forum. I have to, um, hold on for a second and I'll pull it up and I'll paste that in there. I don't know the URL off the top of my head. Okay, here is the URL for Metal Clay and Mixed Media. So we'll be looking for those drawings from now till tomorrow. I'll try to put up a prompt. I'm hoping that we have talked about things that you could actually tap into for making something new and exciting. Well, Jackie, I'll have to um, invite you to Metal Clay and Mixed Media and then you'll know where it is. That's correct, Donna. Um, you can take anything as your inspiration. Um, I just gave you some specific things as starters, but you don't have to use them. And when you're posting, I just want to know what your inspiration was and how you got to where you got. Just to be clear, this is like a fun challenge. This is a, you know, this is a challenge based on, on this. And, um, it's a personal challenge. And I'm glad to hear a lot of people are challenging themselves to try something new. So again, the URL is in the comments. And okay, so I have Deborah saying she's a horrible sketcher, but 
you know what? You could do it a polymer clay mold. You could do it in metal clay. You could do anything you want to help articulate um, what you decided to do. And so however it gets out of your head is fine with me. The whole idea is to stimulate that creativity. Yeah, and, and I think it would be a really great idea if you described how you got to where you where you landed. You know, if it was um, it was the feel of the item that inspired this, or it was um, the texture that inspired this, or it reminded me of this experience. And I'm glad to hear someone uh, talking about all of their inspirations and how it's going to start some major flooding of ideas. So that's really great. And again, um, you don't have to draw if you can't draw. If, if you're better at um, molding it, um, whatever. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Danelle. Oh, great, Kim. I'm glad you'll be trying this. You need some stimulation, I'm sure. I miss you. Oh, got another. Oh, Sherry's going to do it. See, here are these names, because these are the names we're going to look for on the, the forum. Looking at half a sandwich, <laughs> a can of cinnamon, and a toy of a flying monkey. Ah, that should be interesting. And thank you, Lisa, I appreciate that. Great, Avery's in, Ava is in, sorry, Ava's in. And I'm seeing that Danelle has a difficult gemstone to work with, so I'm hoping uh, this brings out some something else in you. And Jackie said her mouth is on fire because she had pepper. <laughs> and Kim has some purple crystals. I'm going to try them. Great. Janelle, nice to see you. I'm in. Okay. So it's great to see all these people in, but I really want to see you in on the forum because that's when I know you're really in. Somebody's got a jar of cinnamon, gummy worms, and seashells. Oh, that should be interesting. No promises, but let me see what I can do. This gives me a great jump off place. It's a good jump off place, but actually, if you commit, it'll be a great jump off place. Just saying. I'm glad you felt like that you learned something. That's awesome, Jessica. And Deborah Ellen's going to try. So I named a lot of people that are going to try. So I'm really looking forward to seeing these. A, a candle lantern, Parmesan cheese, and nutmeg. Hmm. That should be an interesting combination. Boy, I really you really challenged yourselves with the kinds of items that you pick. That's for sure. No idea what I'll do with it. Well, that's the challenge, that's for sure. And Amy's going to try the challenge. Woohoo, Amy! Well, I'm going to send you off into the creative world. Thank you so much. Um, we love you.